Hello again, welcome back, and I would like to announce now our dear Ali Dragozet, who will tell us more about sustainable tourism. Let's give a warm applause to Ali. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ali Dragozet, and I'm the founder and CEO of Sea Going Green. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability and what that means in the yachting and boating industry. So a little bit different than the talks we've heard so far. I've also heard that I'm the first sustainability talker at this kind of summit. So a big position to be in and I'm also the last session before lunch. So tough place for me. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep it a little bit more brief and leave a little bit more time at the end for Q&A so we can also have a discussion about sustainability. So as I mentioned, I'm Ali, founder and CEO of Sea Going Green. I was born in Serbia, half Croatian, and I was raised in Canada. A little bit about background of me, I studied pre-med actually. I wanted to be a doctor, that was my big, big dream. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't really love the healthcare and business aspect that I was seeing in Canada. And being a diver, I wanted to do something with environmental sciences, so I switched into biological anthropology and environmental biology, did a lot of internships in oceanography and more marine sciences, and decided that's really wanna, what I wanna specialize in. I was lucky enough that actually before the age of 21, I lived in six countries, and one of these countries was Singapore. I did my minor in tropical conservation biology there, where I really fell in love with the marine environment even more but also with Southeast Asia. But at the same time, I was also seeing all the negative impacts of tourism and the growing uh, sector there on the local community and the marine environment, plastic pollution at a completely different scale than I've ever seen before. So this kind of balance between communities and tourism is always something I've been interested in. Throughout my studies, I also always worked in tourism as a side job, so really working with destination management companies all over North America and the Caribbean. I took this one step further to really specialize in marine biology in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, which is where I'm based right now. So enough about my background, but I do want to tell you where I spent my summers. So I spent my summers in Peroy, and I see someone in the audience who I also know from that time. Uh, and this is Peroy. Uh, it's an amazing uh, little village in Croatia. And Croatia wasn't the most popular tourism destination when I was growing up but now we all know that it's one of the most hottest destinations in the world. And I was really interested every summer going back here, really talking to the local community and learning from them how they were happy that they can actually work for four or five months of the year and then live off of that for the rest of the year. But at the same time, they were talking about negative things like, hey, we have to clean up after the tourists. Us as divers and snorkelers were also seeing the water quality going down. There was less fish. So again, there was this kind of this push and pull between community and tourism. So now I want you to imagine diving in the Great Barrier Reef. Hopefully this video works. Yes. So as a marine biologist, this is the kind of reef I always want to see. It's nice, healthy, and happy. But unfortunately, this is more and more of what we're actually seeing. And these kinds of changes now can really happen in a matter of months and not decades like before. And we're actually set to lose around 75% of the world's coral reefs by 2050. And more recent research is showing that this number is actually closer to 90%. And as the reefs are dying, the tourism industry is only growing we're actually set to reach 1.8 billion international tourism arrivals by 2030. And I think that we're going to reach this number much, much sooner with the revenge tourism trend that we're actually seeing post-COVID. So why is this happening? I mean, ocean degradation is a huge, multifaceted, super complex issue. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here today. So anthropogenic effects. This is basically how human, uh, human impact and human activity is actually affecting the oceans. So we can talk about unregulated and exponential tourism growth. I don't know if you're aware, but all of those beach views, those ocean views that we have kind of come with a price. You have to think about these hotels being built on beaches. Usually mangroves are getting ripped up and then they put the beaches, uh, the hotels straight on the beaches, which then leads to shore erosion, which then leads to coral bleaching and ocean acidification. So it kind of is this unfortunate domino effect that's happening. So, how does boating and yachting actually fit into this? 
I don't think I want to tell this audience why we love voting. It's why we're all here today, my, myself included. But I didn't want to kind of highlight these four big issues that we're seeing, the negative impacts from the boating and maritime leisure industry. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into pollution, degradation and habitat loss, disruption of biodiversity, and climate change. So when we're talking about pollution, more specifically liquid pollution, we're really talking all about the fuel and oil leaks and spills that you can have from your vessels, as well as the negative discharge of gray and black water, which is leading to eutrophication of our waters, as well as runoff of toxic products, such as anti-fouling paints and sunscreens. In terms of solid pollutions, this is all about marine litter, plastic pollution, and other pollution, such as noise pollution, that we don't talk about enough. On the topic of plastic pollution, cigarette butts are actually the single greatest source of ocean trash. And a lot of people don't know that there actually are plastics in these cigarette butts. And one cigarette butt can contaminate over seven liters of water in under an hour. And in a study, it was shown that 50% of the animals that were exposed to this water actually fell ill. Now you can imagine what this water is actually doing to our human and other marine life that's coming into contact with this. Moving on to disruption of uh, biodiversity. So here we're seeing changes in behavioral patterns in the food chain through animal feeding, pollution, and increased boating activities, as well as the depletion of fish stocks through recreational fishing that isn't getting managed properly. We're also going one step further where we're actually completely changing how marine life actually interacts in the natural marine environment. So I'm sure everyone's seen this very famous photo of the seahorse. Of course, the seahorse didn't grow up always being on this Q-tip, right? I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> it used to be on like just a random piece of seagrass floating around, and then it went onto the plastic bag, and then of course the famous photo of the Q-tip. So we're completely changing how marine life is actually interacting in its own natural habitat with our plastic trash. We're going one step further where we're actually making a completely new food chain. So the plastics that we're consuming are turning into microplastics, which are then going into the food that we eat, and then into us, of course. And now studies are showing that an average human consumes about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. So you can just imagine the kinds of plastics that are entering our bodies, and we don't even know the long-term effects of plastics on human health. But if we can kind of compare it to heavy metals, for example, what happens there is bioaccumulation. Basically, the higher it goes up the food chain, the worse the impacts are. We know it's not a good effect. The studies of plastics on human health are still very much at the beginning phase, so I'm not gonna dive too deep into this, but I just wanted to highlight some good studies that have come out so far, showing how it actually can alter your liver function, change your insulin resistance, so it's really a big issue that we're, we need to tackle also in this industry. So for degradation and habitat loss, uh, the biggest impacts here are uh, anchoring impacts also and prop scarring of seagrass beds. So prop scarring happens when you're using a propellers in really shallow waters and actually ripping up the roots from the seagrass. Uh, and seagrass is really important for marine biodiversity as it's a really powerful carbon sequesterer, basically taking carbon out of our air, which is what we want to do. And of course, erosion through increased boating activities and boat wakes. So boat wakes are also happening when it's a little bit too close to shore and then doing shore erosion. An interesting fact I found also is that one of the biggest threats to MPAs is actually uh, impacts from anchors from the leisure boating industry. So I think for this industry, it's also really important to know what kind of impact you're having, even in these marine protected areas. Climate change. <laughs> so obviously we're not going to solve climate change today, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that's happening in the industry and how we can actually go about this. So for air emissions of pol and pollutants of greenhouse gases, so here we're also really talking about all the kinds of fuels that we use in the industry and the cleaning products as well. So what can marine sustainability actually look like? I know I just bogged you down with a lot of negative impacts, and now we're going to go more positive. So you can start with carbon footprinting. Carbon footprinting is a really great metric where you can really start to understand your impact on sustainability and what you can actually do about it. 
From this, you can also build responsible and sustainable voting practices, uh, have good waste and water management facilities and policies, as well as wildlife and habitat protection and pollution prevention measures, as well as using eco-friendly products. So, how can you actually vote and operate sustainably? So going through those same categories again, I wanna give some practical tips. So for the liquids category, in terms of oil and fuel spills, you can really look at spill-proof uh, fueling, uh, which is getting more and more updated in the industry every year. Having regular maintenance, of course, of all your vessels. For a sewage black water, of course, having proper discharge of the black water at the appropriate facilities, and if none are available, really discharging them at appropriate distance far away. Uh, and if not, seeing if you can actually hold it uh, until you can properly dispose of it. For non-sewage gray water, checking really local marina to learn where you can dispose of gray water. Uh, using water saving devices, so I have some clients, uh, some of our partners listed up here that I'm happy to talk about a little later on. And of course, using non-toxic cleaners. On the topic of non-toxic products, a big one in the industry is, of course, also using anti-fouling paints that are not based on TBT, which actually uh, has zinc and copper in it, uh, which are heavy metals, of course, and offering and using non-toxin cleaners and shampoos also for body care for your guests. The last one in this category is reef-safe sunscreens. So a lot of people don't really know the impacts of sunscreens on the marine environment, and it's definitely something that's still getting studied, but all the studies that are coming out so far are showing that it has quite a negative effect. Uh, you can kind of think about it as clogging the pores of coral reefs, which isn't a good thing. And islands like Hawaii have completely banned non-reef safe sunscreens, so these are just some examples of good ones that we found. So for uh, solid pollution, what you can do is, of course, not contributing to marine litter. So really trying to practice this leave no trace behind policy. Of course, if you're also coming across litter, trying to clean it up or organize cleanups, something we're seeing a lot more in the yachting industry. Avoiding plastic usage, of course, this is the easiest first thing you can do is actually just eliminate or uh, really respect the three R's, the reduce, reuse, recycle policy and using biodegradable fishing gear where available if you are into recreational fishing, as ghost fishing gear is also one of the biggest sources of ocean trash in the world. For noise pollution, uh, it's all about not using sound speakers in sensitive areas like marine protected areas and accelerating slowly away from the shore, not circling in one area but going in a straight line to actually spread the noise and using sound insulation. In terms of degradation, it can really be uh, prevented by knowing your erosion impacts. So driving slowly, really obeying these no-wake zones, staying away from the shore, and av avoiding the big risk areas. For seagrass beds, it's a little different. We are seeing some navigation companies actually putting the locations of seagrass on the map, so you as boaters can actually see where they are and try to avoid them. And then, of course, avoid using the propellers in the shallow waters where we know they are more and knowing your depth and draft really well. For anchoring and no anchoring zones, it's really important to actually respect them. If possible, of course, always anchoring in sand and mud. And if you're revisiting the same sites, uh, trying to anchor in the same place so that you're not spreading the impact, as well as using existing mooring buoys where possible. Same thing for marine protected areas, really learning where they are. Uh, when we work with yachting clients, we're also very surprised that a lot of them don't know where the marine protected areas are, where they're operating. So this is kind of the first step, knowing what rules actually apply in those marine protected areas and what you and your customers can do uh, to actually conserve them. And now to dive into an example of what can happen to a destination if these sustainability policies aren't put in practice. So I don't know if you've heard of uh, Maya Beach in Thailand. It got really popular from the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, The Beach. I was really lucky enough to actually go visit this in 2013. But honestly, all I can remember is like a thick layer of sunscreen in the water, thousands of people and hundreds of boats. <laughs> so it wasn't a good experience. And in 2018, the Thai government actually made the difficult decision to close down this destination completely. And this meant over $1 billion uh, lost in revenue 
over 20,000 jobs and complete relocation of anyone who was working in this area. In 2022, then they decided to reopen with these new sustainability pr uh, practices in place. And then they closed down for a couple months again, really trying to give the marine life a fighting chance. I was lucky enough to actually <clears throat> uh, talk to one of the sustainability officers who was in charge of this project, and I asked him, how did you reopen? What did you do? And he told me how they actually built a boardwalk on top of the beach so that no one will actually ever be able to walk on Maya Beach ever again. And you can't actually dock over 100 meters from the shore. And that's how they were going to conserve it now. Yes, perfect. And now, diving into disruption of biodiversity and how we can tackle that. So, boating near wildlife is always a big no-no. We're trying to remain at least 100 yards away from any marine animals. Of course, never chasing them, never feeding them. And if a marine mammal kind of approaches you, trying to turn off and go neutral until they swim away peacefully. In terms of eco-friendly fishing, this is <laughs> definitely a touchy subject. I don't know if that exists. But if you are practicing recreational fishing, uh, releasing fish back into the water that you're not planning to eat, of course, trying to release the fish without damage, uh, adhering to local fishing rules and uh, how many you can actually catch, of course, learning about endang endangered species and putting them back in the water if you do catch them, and preventing ghost fishing gear, so not letting any fishing gear going back into the water. The last one here is preventing invasive species. So this is actually quite a big one in the boating industry. Invasive species like to travel with boats. Uh, so that's definitely something that we recommend to our yachting clients is actually to wash your boats between all visits and learning to identify the invasive species as well. As for climate change, so carbon footprinting, uh, it's a good way, again, as I said, to start uh, really measuring your metrics and knowing what your impact is and then finding ways to actually strategize to mitigate them. Um, in the short term, the ones that you actually can't reduce, you can't offset. Offsetting is definitely a tricky greenwashing kind of thing in the industry, unfortunately. But it is something we recommend as a very short-term solution for those carbon emissions that you actually can't get rid of. In the short term, at least you can support some good local projects. Here's an example of Seagrass Grow, for example, which is an NGO in Puerto Rico that plants seagrass. Uh, so they're a really good carbon uh, footprinting. Also, of course, reducing fuel usage. This is all about using other kinds of renewable energies that you could use, more clean uh, burning fuel, performing regular engine maintenance, reducing the extra weight on board, and using a fuel efficient engine, which also is a, is a huge money saver. In terms of other kind of energy, also looking at the electricity uh, that, your, that your boats are needing, of course, and where you're docking, what kind of energy sources your docks are also using. So now I also wanted to dive into a real-life example. So this is one of our clients that we've been working with uh, for almost six years now. Uh, it's called Boat Bike Tours. They're a river cruise company in the Netherlands. Uh, they're one of the biggest there. And we started by working with them by measuring their carbon footprint and then making strategies for how to reduce it. And we're really proud to say that over these last few years that we've been working together, that they've actually reduced their carbon footprint by 50%, which is amazing for a river cruise. <laughs> I mean, these are like dirty old big boats, so we're really proud of that. And they're going further by actually also offsetting all the carbon that they can't um, reduce right now with this amazing NGO called Just Dig It, which is regreening areas uh, in Africa. They're also going uh, one step further where they're not actually just doing these for the boats, but also with office and back of house stuff. So looking at biodegradable eco-friendly cleaning products, uh, using vegetarian menus for their staff and also for the boats as well. We did an amazing study actually to look at the food sustainability of the boats and if you were to swap meat, for example, with other veggie options, and it was a huge carbon and money saving tactic. They also joined a big European Commission project, so this is something I also wanted to highlight. With all these big policies being put into place in the EU Green Deal, there's also some amazing funding opportunities for tour operators like yourselves. So they just joined one of these projects, which is called Sustor, which is all about helping tour operators actually uh, adapt sustainability measures into place. And they also are uh, active with the local green certification. 
think that my video now. <laughs> I'm just gonna play a quick one minute video. Perfect, yeah. So with both bike tours, they also really tried to get their customers on their sustainability journey with them, really asking them, what do you want to see from us with sustainability? The Yacht Week in this video did the same thing, and they talked about having more community impacts, community cleanups, and things like that. And this company actually was doing these cleanups every year. They just weren't publicizing it. So then when we started working with them, we said, you know, let's do this big campaign around to get the local community involved so that they can see that this tour operator was actually uh, doing something to clean up the area that they're so dependent on for their tourism product. So that was just like a really nice experience for us. And I wanted to leave you with some really practical uh, certification and programs to join. There's a lot of free resources out there. You don't just have to work with consultants. There's a lot of resources that you can take uh, and work with. So going from the boating community of Sailors for the Sea, Sustainable Diving, for example, uh, the Blue Flag Award, which is a voluntary uh, flag program. If you want to go even deeper, you can also go into certification. So there is certifications from Blue, from Oceanic Global, Travel Life, Earth Check. We work with all these programs, so I'll be around all week. If you want to talk about these, I'm happy to dive into them. So why are we doing all of this? Obviously, we all want to conserve the marine environment, but there also is this huge growing demand for sustainable tourism and boating. So some new stats that we're finding is that in booking.com, they found that almost three quarters of the interviewed travelers actually want to travel more sustainably in the next year. And they're actually expecting that the sustainable tourism market is actually gonna grow by over 23% in the next decade. They're also finding that tourists are more willing to pay for more eco-labeled kind of tours. And 60% were more likely to choose an eco-labeled tour over not. And what is it, 65.9% were actually more likely to pay over 20% more for an equal label tour. So it's actually a huge business opportunity as well. So this brings me to Sea Going Green and what we actually do. So our big mission is really to alleviate the negative impacts of tourism on the marine environment. We do this by working under the sustainable development goals. So this is just some of my, my local team. And we have this four-pronged approach. So we always start with an environmental impact assessment. We really specialize in carbon footprinting and managing those carbon footprints for private sector clients, such as yachting companies, river cruises, and coastal hotels. And then we build responsible tourism policies for this, uh, for them, and also help with any kind of training and capacity building they need as well, as well as any kind of green branding campaigns that they need too. So other than just working with the private sector, we're also working with the public sector now, more on the destination kind of strategy and policy work, actually making sustainable tourism master plans, uh, mostly for small island developing states, but also going uh, in a little bit other direction, more inland as well. And this means that we're actually talking with the ministries of tourism to talk about what kind of tourism products should be, um, uh, yeah, should really be opening in these new emerging markets. Just some of our clients over the last few years. Some nice press attention we've been getting. And I wanna leave you with my favorite quote, which is really that a destination ultimately loses its profitability when it loses its beauty, which is why we're so focused on this. And a couple of the partners that I mentioned during my talk, so some reusable water bottles with great filters, uh, water filtration devices also for yachts that save a lot of water for them, and some reef safe sunscreen. So I'm happy to share these slides and, and these companies later on as well. So I know I finished a little early because I really just wanted to have an open discussion, so happy to uh, talk anything about sustainability. Thank you so much.
Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, everybody knows this is important. I think everybody here does. But making the first step is always very difficult, no matter who you are. What recommendation do you make? Because the first step should also be very easy. Otherwise, people won't do it. <laughs> so what advice do you give in terms of making the simple, easy first step? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah, we hear this with clients all the time. I mean, we work with yachting companies who are very down the line in their sustainability journey and are doing amazing things and some who haven't done anything. So we've really seen it all. Um, th this is why I put these kinds of really easy, easy resources here as well. There's a lot of online resources where you can kind of learn about these easy things that you can do. And I really try to like digest the practical step-by-step -step things you can do for pollution, for example, your fuels, maintenance, easy things like that which can actually make a huge impact and also kind of starting a community I mean that's what we're seeing also with boat bike tours for example in the Netherlands is that they're kind of starting this huge sustainable river cruise community that came after they started working with us where they talk with other fleet owners as well and talk about you know what kind of engines do you have and like really learning from each other kind of like a working group so I would recommend looking at these online free resources finding a community that can help you and then of course if you need consultants to take you through there, there's many that I can recommend other than this as well. <laughs> I'm here till Friday, so if you have questions, feel free, we can have a coffee later, chat about this, dive into some of this deeper, uh, it's no problem. Great, thank you. <laughs>